in 2001. And um, the series has the, uh, the Stiftungslecture, which is a part of the um, uh, public lecture series that the architecture class hosts every summer, summer semester, sees then an um, alumnus, a graduate from the Still School Architecture class, <coughs> big point, <coughs> return to give a lecture and to tell about um, work and life after having studied here. And um, we've had the occasion to um, see numerous exciting um, works and hear wonderful lectures in this then annual lecture. And of course also with the Stiftung it's uh, an occasion to also see that the architecture class um, maintains or um, keeps on attending to the spirit of Günther Bock. And this was a spirit that um, was obviously very much set in the Städelschule, but it was also uh, therefore reflecting that possible relationship that exists between architecture and the arts. And Günther Bock was one to always um, embody that, also in spirit. And I think it's a um, particularly wonderful occasion to welcome Gert Stockmann, uh, since um, knowing his work to some degree, um, I think that body of work very much also represents the same. The Stiftung, meanwhile, um, supports us here. It also supports us with the prize that carries Günther Bock's name, the Günther Bock Prize. And the um, relationship between the Stiftung and the architecture class continues to be central to the well-being of our little program. And Uli Scheffler, who's here, who's the um, chair of the board, um, represents the Stiftung tonight. And thank you also for, for coming, Uli. So I was studying at the, uh, I began studying architecture in London at the AA in 87, 1987 I think it was. And not long after that, going into Triangle Bookshop, which is a wonderful, was a wonderful, still is a bookshop at the AA, but it was a wonderful little uh, place where one could always spend hours looking through things. There was a very curious, almost bright yellow book lying around. And this was the a book that uh, contained the work of Formalhaut. And not unbeknownst to, to me at the time, this was the group that was founded by um, Götz and his uh, partner Gabriela Seifert, together with the artist also Ottmar Hörl in 1985. Um, Hörl left the group in around 1991, if I remember correctly. And I remember opening the book and seeing the most extraordinary and strange work. At least it seemed strange to me then, and perhaps still uh, presents itself in retrospect with a wonderful, wonderful strangeness. There was, for instance, the cow project with cows, presumably here in Hessen, standing in a field, all boxed in, in plastic. And then there was the um, a sports, I think it was called a sports hall. And this was a much smaller plastic encasement that basically had a human figure, a man, um, positioned as if he was doing push-ups. And these kind of works, together with extraordinary drawings, documenting, I believe what Peter Cook reports in his introduction to the uh, publication, a, a graduation project which you, at least for a time being, got, uh, were embarrassed to um, look at. That's what Peter Cook says in the introduction. Um, but the project was nevertheless documented with the extraordinary drawings. And this was my first occasion of getting to know von Malhaut and then later coming here, of course, um, learning that um, this was um, authored, or co-authored if you want, by Götz, um, who started in the Städelschule with Peter Cook, um, finished in 1980 after a uh, architectural diploma at the Polytechnical School here in Frankfurt. 
Um, he went on to found the architectural studio that he still has with um, Gabriela Seifert. She's a professor in Innsbruck and uh, um, currently the dean of architecture there. For Malhauten in 1985. And their work spans from um, photographic work to sculptural work to architecture, and I think um, we all know about um, extraordinary but also seminal um, living room, which sits up just up on the hill outside Frankfurt, an extraordinary building that seemed to do what became a fashion about, my guess is about 10 years later, both in terms of uh, typology, the relationship between the basic um, form of the house and the solution of the roof, and not the least with the um, extraordinary facades, which has a, I think remember reading um, something like 54 windows. Now, um, it is a um, work that is uh, spirited, that seems to smoothly cross, and perhaps also sometimes painfully cross between um, that of presumably belonging to the arts and at the same time belonging to architecture. And it's work that also Peter Cook attests to in his introduction as um, reflecting an attitude that is Goethe's towards objects or perhaps the world as a matter of fact. Yes, we're very excited to have you here tonight, and we look greatly forward to hear you speak about, um, hopefully, a little bit about Stadelschule in your times, and then also your work. Please welcome Götz Stockmann. Good evening. This is not a home play for me. I have been here for a long time and enjoyed the school greatly. Um, but I got somehow alienated from this place. And uh, I think and I hope that I get my act together and entertain you well. Um, I think what you were saying hits it on the spot. Um, I think, in fact, Gabi and myself and Ottmar at that time were a result of um, what Günther Bock was trying to advocate that um, the arts, or that architecture is part of the arts, and that architecture needs to become much more conceptual, and then you should have a crossover, say, between the arts and architecture. And um, Johan was describing that, I think, very good. I think Gabi and my, our work is very much related to this idea of this guy, um, which stems of a picture which is the be weeping of Christ. And I think Günther Bock at that moment where he left the school knew very well that he looks for a person who would succeed him. And he was aiming very high. He, he, he collected the money of that school. The artists were ruled out somehow. They were surprised by all the money of the whole, the whole year that it went to invite these people who were at that time where the architectural world, I suppose, was a much smaller one. You had much less um, uh, communicative means. You had a few magazines and so on and so forth. But it's not like today where you have a web and you are in contact across the world. It was much more isolated. And the unit which Günther Bock was running was <laughs> consisting of two students, and I was one of them. OK? <laughs> very strange. Very, very strange. And he launched the Art Detector, and that changed the whole worldview I had. Because he had the nuts to invite people who he was never superior to. He was a very well-educated um, person and a rather good architect, and we enjoyed him greatly. But if you remember the list, it was quite something to install such a thing, and you may recognize this, this is me, where the little arrow sits. Um, in great astonishment, I suppose, and that is Günther. And the conception he had was to really aim very high. He was aiming at, in fact, at um, Rem Kohlhaas, but Rem Kohlhaas then already knew that this is much too small for his purposes. And it got to Peter in the end. But just to give you an idea of what the talk was about, Günther was reading out the um, 
stories by of um, Super Studio. And it was shaking in laughter what they were supposing about utopia. We spoke about utopia, right? Which is not a conversation today, I suppose. And we were talking about Super Studio, um, Archigram, Archizoom. We heard about Manfredo Trafuri, who would criticize um, the utopian people because they were still doing something representational, which he thought was impossible as an urban concept. So that was the kind of frame which, in which we were. And then uh, there was a diversity in architecture. You had um, Dalibor Wesley, who would almost represent the classical, and I mean it. And at the same time, Foster was building uh, the Sainsbury Center in, in England, which was a rather impressive building. And we had more. We had um, a conversation of the beginning, the very early beginnings of de deconstructivism, um, postmodern. We had um, high tech, which I was mentioning. Before. So there was a very diverse situation, and my I later then came to the Architectural Association um, and studied there from, I was here between 78 and, seven, and 81 and then I went straight to England and enjoyed that greatly. Um, the Peter Cook, Ron Heron, Warren Chalk, David, all these people from Archicam were, were available. So I came, as you were mentioning, from a polytech, which I which was good for me. I know how to draw a bloody window, a stairwell, the lot. I can do this. So construction to me is something which is um, more a narrative means. It doesn't bother me in terms of does it leak? It will not leak. You will get out of the building in the given time on the fire escape and so on. That's, that's the rules of the ball game. Um, I return to the Städelschule and took this very much to my heart that the conversation and it opened up already. So these people belonged to um, our friends and they were also their work. One is sitting here, Achim sits here. Thanks for being here, Achim. This guy. <laughs> um, Otmar, who left us in uh, 10 years after we had started for Mannheim because his business career didn't go as fast as our career. In fact, we had a very good start with the cow scheme. And I think five, four years later, we invited these people to take part in the design of the house, which was mentioned, living room. And they all have a vital part in this. They were asked, they got a honorarium of uh, 2,000 euros, and they got a 125 model and they were asked to come up with a scheme for the house. And they knew how the house was meant. And they delivered. And most of that work is also executed by us. And in the later phase, we, which is now, um, we have asked, and that's to do with this person. I'm in the provinces, a half an hour away from here, which is called Gelnhausen. And Gelnhausen is famous, and most of you cannot know this. And even the Germans may not know it. But it is the, um, he was born, Grimmelshausen was the most important Baroque uh, novelist in Germany. And he has written a book which is called Simplicius Simplicissimus. We, we in Gelnhausen, at Gelnhausen, at school time, were going backwards and forwards and sideways <laughs> on that book. So there is a long tradition in Gelnhausen about poetry, about um, literature. Uh, Brentano was there. Um, by the way, Goethe isn't far off, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a real nest <laughs> in Gelnhausen, not really belongs to that, but with Grimmelshausen has a very, very good representative. So the people we then worked with uh, in Gelnhausen, and he did the, that will be my final, he did the poem which is written on the house and calls it, the house is the mouth cave. He means it, and the poem talks about this. And this poem is only on that house. He's one of the, I think I can, I can say he's probably the most known and most important, unfortunately dead by now, poet which uh, we have brought about in our culture these days. And we have recently asked um, Uliana Wolf. She, so he wrote a poem, poem upon the living room house. And now we ask Uliana, and she has delivered as well, to write a poem about the road in which the house is. By the way, in, I was talking on this in 
Australia four weeks ago, and they called that idea to come along with poetry, postmodern. I have never looked into that from that angle. <laughs> I was quite surprised to hear this, at any rate. Um, Gabi, who was mentioned, um, we practiced since a long while, since 19, we were a couple. I don't think I'm saying something which is indiscreet, but we were a couple from school days and we studied together and we were split then already, <laughs> but financed the new house. And Gabi came across with a scheme, which was a typical uh, Fomar art scheme. Uh, we bought 1,200 carnations uh, afresh in the market here in Frankfurt and planted them on the old structure which had to go for the new one. And obviously this is very <laughs> a very emotional image to me and also to Gabi because with the house all the memory went of our relation and so on and so forth. And we called that scheme by Bai Kugas or in other words reincarnation and the carnation is the thing which yeah, drives it. I would like to say a few things because, by the way, my, my portfolio is by one of the English friends, Tony Meadows, who just was on a visit. We know each other since I calculated 39 years. That's when they came first from the AA to join us here and to make an exchange with two students and one, <laughs> and one teacher, which was a joke. And he calls my portfolio the portfolio of madness. I hope I'm good to fulfill and to deliver. Um, Alois Riegel, is there anybody here who would know this person? I don't care. He's my big hero, he's our big hero. He's, and I'm even talking um, 19th century, I can only defend myself if I raise the name of uh, Max Planck, who then um, introduced quantum physics. And I think these people knew each other. They were in Vienna. And Riegel is, for that reason, um, he speaks about the spatial border. And I will give you a short outlook how he describes that. And he speaks about the will for form. Kunstwollen is a German word which is, I think, not translatable into English, or do you know of them? So that's why I, I offer to the will to form or the volition to produ produce art, which he sees as an almost an instinct of man female and males, that you discover maybe with, think of Lascaux and the first drawing in caves, or think of Gabanmung, which is proved to be 60,000 years old. That's a location in Australia which belongs to the indigenous uh, society who practice their mythology, their initiation and all of that continuously since 60,000 years until today. Why did they start to draw? To embellish this funny rock? No. Uh, to pass something on to their fellow, fellows and to their kid, kids? I think they discovered that they can draw. And somehow this links back to the idea of Riegel. Um, I know it from him, not, not the other way around. You discover that you are able to create something. And this is what you really like to do. And then all of a sudden, and, and then of course you are in a situation where you notice that she's doing it better than I can do it, and so on and so forth. So somehow this will come into, a, into being. And this idea certainly, and I know that this is a very tricky word, but I don't care, is to do with the question of beauty. Right? So the production of anybody is, in, is debated in a society which produces culture, to which you may call any type of building, or sculpture, or poetry, sing sang dance, music, blah, 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 has a relation to a certain, I would argue, instinct in us, which is the will for art. Alois Riegel proposes a very nice allegory on, I'm very short on this, I'm finishing five minutes in this picture. Okay. He has a very nice allegory on the subject architecture, he says. Unfortunately, um, architects produce finite spaces. And it's very unpleasant because it borders on um, a measure which limits 
man's ability to move about because you have borders like without room. So that's, is a, he calls that a dilemma. But he has a very nice preposition. Proposition, sorry. He says, how can we overcome this? And that's why I mentioned Max Planck. Um, either you push these spatial borders. That's a spatial border. That's a spatial border. And see, is another space. They're all different. You push them so far to the limit that they are at the horizon. <coughs> but you know that this is not possible. So what's the choice? And that's the nice thing about his ex Impression, he says, or his idea, he says, the choice is very simple. You make them so pretty, I'm not talking necessarily about this room, and not every room is a cathedral, we know that from Mies. You make them so pretty that you want them. That's architecture. I find that very supportive to, to have that notion that it is obviously something which also at the same time this not the function that you sit here, or the program, but that a wall, or a floor, or a ceiling, and I know that there is glass above that, is absolutely autonomous as a means. And that, in that field, I find architecture has a great deal of autonomy. And what Regal is talking about when he talks about spatial border is obviously matter. And you know it from physics that the equivalent is energy. And there could, instead of my little silhouette, there could be um, a mathematical sign which is matter is the same as energy. And all what I like to add is that we have a few, a little time ago, Gabi and myself, we came about these two sentences which we simply establish in relation to matter and energy, we simply believe that if you are in a position as an architect that you create a spatial phenomenon which needs a spatial border, and you understand that you have an inside and an outside, which is unique, nobody else does that. We do this. We, we do the insides. And you need to know about the outside. And that is not an absolute, because the square in the city is also an inside, and outside is the city, and so on and so forth. But we believe that if you talk and debate beauty, and you debate beauty as in relation to matter or mass, there's still light. And we believe that light has a different idea of beauty than mass. And we propose two sentences. <laughs> yes, I'm too far off. Which you could read here. We say in sentence one, and that relates to mass, and pro probably rather more to solid state physics. It is going the more visibility a boundary has relative to its captured void, the more the boundary can be the agent of the beauty of this void. I explain that to you in very simple terms. You recover this is a nutshell, right? There's a, there's a space in there inside here. But we say the nutshell has so much presence that you see more of the nutshell as the recognition of the space. That's very simple. Now, if you talk about phenomena which are above the horizons or at a great distance, this is all still to do with the idea of mass. But if you and even that is mass. I saw it by somebody walking past, and Jens passed it to me. It's, it's the biggest mass accumulation that we can think of. It's a black hole, which they discovered yesterday, <laughs> which is coincidental, anyhow. And the second sentence, uh, and then I'm through with my theory. This is May. I hope it makes you think a little bit. The second one relates to light. And we refer in spatial terms to anything which is above the horizon, let's say about the universe. And we say in sentence number two, which you can read down here, the more vast the space relative to its boundary, the greater will it be its agency for the beauty of space. So beauty really bothers us. And we are quite concerned that the beauty which comes from a spatial phenomena, which is certainly in our Western thinking, infinite. Now, again, 
remind you of my report about Riegel and quantum physics and Max Planck. So we believe that the quality of beauty is different with the condition of light than with the condition of mass. Fine, I'm through. Yeah, that was on the news yesterday. I find that quite. And then I'm coming to the work, and I decided, and I was, to be very descriptive, because it it is a, it's very different. All the slides are slides, yeah. old school. There you see from Mannhardt in top left. You see from Mannhardt probably in 85 or 80. No, it's 86, and you can see. Um, how we assemble, we do it uh, hands-on, um, there's little money and you somehow need to get it together to arrive at schemes which you think transfer something of that to a public which you would like to address. You know that business. I mean, you are already in it. You are, I was brought up at the AA and it was, I was brought up in the sense that everybody who is at the AA becomes a superstar. It's a big lie. <laughs> Um, but it carried us and um, we had a lot of competition and insanities and so on. But we were, we had that idea in Formalhaut to produce schemes which were independent from spaces which would probably, today you would rent it or you would even pay for it. How do you do that? So we, it was land art which was available to us because the places were around and we arrived at these schemes and produced that within 10 years and had a lot of success. Um, traveled the world, were in storefront, which is still around, so we had a very good reception and great fun and ended up with enormous depth. And Ottmar then decided, because his career as an artist, and he's a rather good artist, is um, for my money, too commercial and too much interested in the bloody money which comes out of it. But that's a different conversation, but he's a very good artist, basically. And Achim, who sits there, is, <laughs> is probably a different opinion. But however, we were, that were the schemes which we produced. And um, to show you maybe two in detail, this is a time without Photoshop, that's for real. Okay, and we had a vet on site so that when the cows. Um, Ruminate is not the right word, you had the right word when they are in this thing and start to read you. That's what, what they were doing. And I think what affects one looking at this is that you are dealing with beings, I guess. That was um, within two weeks we were in Harper's Bazaar. I, it was very successful. And then we did another scheme a little later which was called Double Night Game, which was moved by Bobby Fischer on the pattern of a chess configuration of professional chess players. And we saw that as a condition which, even then there were a few high rise in Frankfurt, it was a condition under which you would probably um, describe a two societies which were trying to um, deal in urban manners. And the chess is the configuration for this. When Ottmar left, um, first of all there was a loss, a big loss. And um, Gabi and myself, we decided, yeah. we were rather forced because we had little money um, to enter the architectural um, provinces and came up with uh, a lot of buildings related to um, industries, which you see there. Um, that's a sports hall. Um, that was the one competition, sports hall, like, which is a kindergarten. This is working like a big toy, this kindergarten. Um, I may say, I may be wrong, but we were never necessarily too much, even so being brought up by Peter Cook and so on, but we were never interested in, in the mainstream. And that's the result. And um, it was a period of about, I think, not more than 10 years, 15 years maybe, where also the office, office had grown into an ordinary architectural office of then maximum. 12 people, we were dealing with other schemes, we did uh, office in Munich and so on and so forth. It's not necessarily that I dislike it, um, I'm okay with it, but the work which is depicted here for example um, is in its nature much more related to um, also say theory based ideas which you cannot build but to is, is very conceptual and that work specifically um, as you can probably discover relates to light 
So perversely we decided to, because we were commuting in and out of Australia quite often, Gabi does that still, she's on boards of RMIT and their extensions here in Europe and I was privileged also to teach there from time to time and we decided to work in Australia with photography but at night time. And the schemes I will show you in a little moment, there's one which I rather like a lot which is the pixels too much but it's the northern celestial sky on meets the southern. So that is the northern sky under the southern hemisphere. Um, what came out, what comes out of that is we would like to do, we are very interested in Australia because it seems that the indigenous population um, is mainly nomadic and their ways to run a continent was, is the best example around the globe to run it sustainable, absolutely sustainable. And now there is a new population um, since 200 years and they dig it over and sell resources. So they will never meet. It's very tragic. Um, but we stay away from that. We don't take a political stand op opposite that. But what we would like to do um, in this little house, which is in the provinces, in Gelenhausen, to have uh, at least in three rather large books, in three atlases, to have an outpost in Australia where we report on the landscape, which is mainly bush and desert, where we report about city and suburbia, and you can already hear it, the one is related to the indigenous society and the, new, the other one is related to the white and yellow society, which is, ranges from Germans to Dutch to English, um, Asian people and so on and so forth. And the third one should then come with um, culture, which is produced by these two very, very different societies. One, the indigenous society is living there since 60,000 years. <laughs> the new one is living there since 200 years. And if you go through Sydney, and I guess some of you are very familiar with it, you know for sure that the indigenous population has no chance at all, zero. Because Sydney is vibrant, it's a wonderful place, um, blah, 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 blah. And the indigenous society is small. Anyhow, this is an example. Um, this time, when I went, when this time I started to prepare to do rock paintings and rock engravings, but I've learned it the hard way that the indigenous society would not like if we document their work. So there must be means and ways to document it in artistic ways. And one of these images I show you, it's a quote from the Finnegan's Wake book about the night by James Joyce. And it's four images. We do the books in a very simple way. We photograph every position, north, east, south, west. I show you four images. And the sentence has no mistakes. It's written correctly. They lived and und loved and left, and is also written correctly, and left. And if you see that the images come up to this size, and they would be hung in a row. So this is an example for the description of the indigenous um, society who has lived there and cannot live there anymore. By artistic means speaking about, trying to speak about them. If we talk about the city, we would be in ordinary places like schoolyards, um, cemeteries, um, harbors in the road, um, central or suburbia, and in this scheme we say, um, as we play we, this is drawn on as we play we which is a sentence by Martin Seel, who is probably familiar to you, who is a philosopher from Frankfurt, from the Frankfurt School. Wir machen so, wie wir es wollen, heißt das mehr oder weniger, und ist probably a different attitude than the indigenous attitude, so there's this collision of these two societies. 
which both live in their own right on this continent, is what we would try to express. And quite obviously, us as architects, we are interested in a living condition which has no house. It's very straight, the way we work, and it's at night, because on the other side of the globe. Um, and we would also encapsulate into the images, obviously, the larger context, which is the cosmic, or I don't know how common that is in English to say, the all, das all. There's a new group of work, um, which is work, um, which is more with, um, how should I put this? It's a crossover to a large degree uh, between architecture and sculpture. And here we do, for example, which, this is a house which was sitting there on the Rocket Lane launching station in Homproich, um, which was offered to us to make a scheme with it. It's two by two by two meters. And we mirror it inside and we have phenomena inside which create its own little world. Very strange about this thing is that you see the outside inside, okay, in this building. Um, then we work, as you can probably sense, we work with tents, um, which we also see as a spatial a border condition, which is probably between such thing, which is a t-shirt, which is also a vessel, um, and a house, which is soft. Or we do um, still life in a Gothic cathedral, which is um, trying to achieve a shape from uh, a wood section, which talks also about the gravity in this wood section. This is a figure which we did in a strange place in Plön, um, which is um, a construct of tents. And that is also on the rocket launching station, a figure which sits in four Euro containers, which are 50 meters long. The exhibition space is 50 meters long, and two by two meters, 220 by 220. And we did a very simple thing. We arranged this geometry and a vanishing point in it. So what we try to achieve is something very basic in the correspondence with space. The house which Johan referred to is this thing, half an hour from here, and I would call it today a very conceptual piece. It is um, livable. Once it was built, I did ask Iris, who is to? That's my wife. <laughs> if she would live there, because it's a little strange inside, as you will discover in a short while. And we lived there since 2004. It was started in 1999, and most of the work is done by me and a number of architectural students who were all paid for it proper. <laughs> yes, yes. It was good fun. Um, the core of the house came from Austria because they, I lived, I didn't live in, but I worked with Martin Häusle, with, me, with whom I work until today. Uh, we did a number of schemes, like the bridge you saw up there with the architectural stuff. We did that jointly. Um, yeah, so that came from far away. You may read through this. Uh, it's on the little brochure which was released by the AA in 1999, describing the house. There you see the plans, which are um, dividing the house in three parts. One is ground floor, which contains the rock. Then um, in the middle one, which is called Journey, you have this drawer which comes out of the house, which goes in and out of the house on the map, electrically. And you have the top, which we call the deck, which has a close relation to the skies, because there are a lot of windows towards the skies. And um, generally, I think, what distinguishes our profession from most of the other cultural endeavors is that we do interiors. I was saying that before. It's also a very straightforward statement. And what we try to achieve in this house, in the provinces, in a small medieval town, is to, to properly exchange the public and the private or the inside and the outside. And 
all the measures are going into that direction. And um, there is, you can call the the elevation the side thing which caters uh, um, an exchange between the inside and, and osmosis. If I choose, if I aim high, <laughs> as a description. Almost anything in the house is handcrafted. And you can see the table here, which is by Wolfgang Louis. And you can see here sits, for example, um, another table leg, which happens to be a cactus, which is a bronze cast. And so it goes. There is um, a number of things which are rather unusual. Achim, his work, he's sitting back there. He said, because the, ha the house is um, so open in visible terms, I would like to open it up auditively. And he installed on the outside of the house three mics and three speakers. And inside the house, three mics and three speakers. And connected that with a program which he designed. And, I can, and we can choose between the transfer of external noise into the house or of internal noise outside the house. Okay. And the noise is um, converted uh, into, different, into a different noise. So if we do something which is very embarrassing in the house, you would not notice that because the noise goes in a different way. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> this was also one of the achievements which we would like to have. And that also goes back to Günther and the idea that if you ask um, an artist um, a modern artist to deliver a work, it would be a work which comes from his body of work. So the body of works which were in this house um, are by very different characters and I recall quite well and probably you have made experience with artists. We had joint meetings and there were really good gathers was on one meeting sitting with the back of everybody else. And they didn't work so well but in the end I think the result is fine. We have a house which is which can talk quite well. This is what I'm, and Gavi the like, we are very interested in a narrative. Um, yes. <coughs> this takes you through the house. This is obviously in the sleeping room. Then the, here again you see, probably you would call that a very conservative uttering that somebody makes a relief, which is behind the bathtub. I agree, but I don't care. I like that. I like variety, not only in the in the craftsmanship, but I like um, or in the philosophy of a house. But I also enjoy variety in very different approaches to a subject. And George Hüter, who comes from a, if I may say so, from um, sculptor stonemason dynasty of Aschaffenburg. Um, came into this room and I was asking him to do me a trompe l'oeil or to do us a trompe l'oeil at the, at the end of the room. This is probably from here to that eight meters. And he came up with the idea to use the bathtub as a kind of a boat, if you like. And behind the boat there is this lake which he then chiseled out of the um, chalk, which is a local chalk from Würzburg. And the bathtub is also made by him. Um, so this is um, having a different conversation than Achim's scheme, for example, which produces the noise in real time. Okay? Or Lütger Gerdes was drawing on the house. You may have seen that in the elevations. There is about 50 or 60 drawings which he did, which are a crisscross between um, a geometric condition, which could be housing of some description, and it could be a water element or a water phenomena. And then you would probably have, yeah, you see that. And this is when the drawer is out, which is very enjoyable. It's, then it's like a simple balcony. I have not probably explained that. The floor with the elevation can move out by three meters. And we enjoy that in the summer more than in the winter, because we would then almost be in the outdoors with our beds and we look into the skies. The neighbors got used to it. We don't do funny things at night in this bed. And they <laughs> all, all good. And in the attic, you see um, the relation which I make up a little, but it's the idea is that you are more related to the skies. Okay. On the whole, you can say that in that house, because of the many windows, you have a very almost as if it was made of glass. You can see exactly what is happening in the outdoors. There is a very, and I 
with Gabi, the air is the same. We live almost public. If we go upstairs, we are private. And um, you get used to it that people, um, not necessarily because they find it so terribly great, that house, but they are nosy. They look inside the windows and you can live by. This is, you see the lens, that's the glass at the top. It lies on the, on the glass and you look down into this. Um, at winter, Iris could buy at some point the next neighbor house. And we decided to leave that as a yard. And we made that discovery that people, it's, it's a phenomena, I'm referring to a phenomena which is an urban phenomena. The, um, everybody knows about people fleeing the countryside and going to the cities. That leads to a condition in the small villages that you don't have shops anymore, not even a butcher is around, so on and so forth. So they um, desert. And people notice uh, um, they are eager to find um, disruption of that boredom which these cities then offer. And small matters like a public or semi-public yard, people wander in and out of that yard, and we started to exhibit our mere beginnings of a more artistic-based work, which I did show you, uh, working with tents um, and other means, and we just hang it there. And people wander into this yard. Now, what kind of shit is that? And some are, it's mostly the females, they are rather friendly and um, more forward than the males, <laughs> and so on. So we come, in, we come to a conversation. Uh, by the way, this is a fountain of the old house, like all the houses in Gelnhausen, because there is clay, gravel, clay, gravel, have their own little wells. And we had this well, which is, um, you see the water table down, and it's still working, and we pump it up, and then the water it spills out of this coat from Pretano. There's Pretano Road is just around the corner, and then it would go over this edge and fall back into it. And it's nice, makes a nice sound in that yard, this little well and has the platonic solids in it. Can I launch that? No. Doesn't do me. Yeah. So that worked with us very fine, this yard. And then the neighbor was asking us if we would purchase his lot, which was an old barn. There we had a guest room already with the attic, and this was the old barn, and here was a building, and there was a listed building. And we, um, in negotiation with the um, Heritage Board, we were got um, permission to demolish it. And you see in this image roughly where we are. And you could somehow have a notion that there's a very nice uh, cathedral um, Roman Gothic, and we belong to the inner circle of this little Mediterranean city, so anything around us is under preservation, heritage, and needs negotiation if you build a new, which I find um, absolutely okay. And it took, in both cases, with the first house, uh, that was a man thing, me and the building director of Gellin House, and we saw each other and knew that it would not work no time. It took us two and a half years to get it to planning permission and then it was built and now the um, city planners also recognize that it, we don't bring tourists to Gellin House, but there are people interested to come for that house and they look and bring a little bit more life into this little road. This is where we are at the moment. So this is the yard I was talking about. That's the barn. And now we have our atelier in here, in this building, and that building should be something which we are not quite sure what it might be, but it should be something which we could use for an event like this, or for music, performance of music, or an art piece by Achim, which he is asking for since a while, and I'm sloppy with it. Um, so it should be some, somehow public. Um, and in the end, when we have left this place, um, this conglomerate, including the yard, should be something which could be carried by a public carrier, somehow of that, that kind. My atelier is this. It's wonderful to sit between the road, which is called Kuhgasse, k 
cow's alley, maybe, right? That was the place in Gelenhausen where you had the butchers, where the slaughtering took place, the uh, Jews, uh, Judengasse is just around the corner where they slaughtered kosher and so on and so forth. And this is exactly what Uliana is talking about in her new poetry. She is married to an American poet. She teaches in Pratt and in Berlin literature. And she came across with the idea because her, she came to our attention because our literature scout uh, Katharina Gewehr um, offered us a number of female poets and she came to our attention because she does poetry which mingles between English and German. And she came up with the term uh, cow guess <laughs> to guess about the cougars and has written her poetry. On that, so this will be on the stairwell which I'm working on at the moment. Here you see um, drawings which were from the planning board and for the planning board, and you see the Kugasa house. This is the yard which we enjoyed for a long while. There was a standing a building standing in this courtyard. This was a liquor shop, including all the other buildings. So this was all liquor shops, and we have bought that for relatively small money and eventually would like to rebuild this and I don't know if I don't have a you shit's monkey money. We have to be careful and I'm doing a lot myself. Last summer I was sitting in the road, I'll show you that, and laid cobblestones from here to there. Very enjoyable. Very enjoyable. Very talkative with the neighbors and so on and people passing by. Um, We were not quite sure how we would build this, so it is more like indications. The building which you find probably very frightening, uh, I'm including myself, if we in the end would be described as really postmodern, we had it. That would be utterly wrong. But you need to know um, a matter of fact, um, I will come to that. A matter of fact is that the biggest basalt um, unit in Europe as a complete rock face is exactly north of Gelenhausen where we live. So it is a very local material and we would like to work with it. That's the poem which is by Kling, which I will read out to you at the end, which is very shortly to come. And from Lütger Gerdes, we bought, only a few of you understand this, the ICHS, that is me in English. And me with an S, I, me with an S means plural of me, which is impossible. That's an artwork which sits in the um, in Krefeld in the collection house um, by Mies. And I have the other one purchased a while ago from Wilker. Wilker, by the way. Um, and the other one sits back there is Achim. Are uh, the two people who Achim is much better read than I am. But Lütke was quite well read and he, with him I taught here, um, architects and artists, um, for example in the design of squares and public spaces and so on. Lütke was the person who really took me to reading and basing the work more on something which is, has a more foundations in terms of theory. This would sit in the attic, so just a single word, visible to the public. Uh, because the attic is glazed on one side and at the same time you would have a poetry which is about which is from now which is about the street in which you walk about and you would have a poem by a Jewish lady who is not very well known but a top poet she was gassed by the Germans in 19 43 I think and she has written poetry on violence between societies, and he refers to the Prussians, which is which where we from stem from. She herself has killed her child in her womb, and she writes about violence of against between societies, and she writes about the violence that she has applied to her child. Very heavy stuff, very heavy stuff, very good poetry that will be on the roof of the new building. In order to connect the two things, in order to connect back to the rock which is in, in the living room, 
and we choose for the basalt, which is also in parts of the living room, this piece of purchase. And I just show you this out, and we can buy basalt columns, which are four meters long. They are all hexagonal. Every single one is a hexagon. We would like to keep on going, and these are also utterings rather than notions, um, how we deal with a sculpture which is a degree from the basalt column. And yes, it reminds you of the column order. But we would like to arrange them in such a way that they are acceptable as a phenomena which is to do with the local rock. And we would like to execute it in a way that it is not a column order, but is a column sculpture. Um, a sculpture. <laughs> okay. In order to arrive at this, um, there's more rock involved. Um, Gelnhausen has a lot of cobblestones in the roads. And again, you talk about basalt and you talk about quartzite. And I, in, arrangement, uh, in agreement with the city, um, we designed this pattern in the road, and that was built last year. Um, and it would probably contain, in this location or on another stairwell, this poem about this road on which this stairwell sits. And we also wanted to do, to deal with the phenomena of roof. You see it right up there, you see a funny roof up there. And this is where I conclude my lecture. We would like to make a connection between the geometry which is participating in the building, between the poetry which talks about the building, talks back to the living room. The whole thing should be of a continuity which has a conversation, if I may put it like this. And I would like to report to you the way we um, try to design this roof and how we get it so, got it so wrong. And I'm... Höhle des Löwen, what is this in English? Lion's Den. I'm, I'm there with you guys, right? So what I'm trying to explain to you, we were... We are engaged in a geometry which shapes that roof which makes it not a roof, it's rather a canopy, rather tall. It's, um, it's two meters more than this height at the front, the gable, and uh, towards the yard it's a parable. So we have a, a loft which is at the front, a gable, uh, a triangle here, and is a parable back there. And what you see here in these drawings were for the, for the town, for the city of Gelnhausen, for the permission. And we have that permission to build that roof, but we don't like that roof anymore because it doesn't carry good enough. I'm old school, okay? I'm old school. I would like to have, and Gabi the like, we would like to have coherence between structural means, material means, and form. And we have indulged quite a bit, and there is Max sitting there from Innsbruck who helped us in that. We are trying to discover, in a rather modest way, but we are trying to discover the complexity of geometry which would take us to a roof, which would be very spoken in that road and into which you look because it is open to the road. So if you walk past and look into this roof, you would see anything which is happening there. And there's also a public server which takes you up there, which you can use. You see that where the, you see the is in the attic of the old barn, then you see the stairwell, this is public, so people can go onto the flat roof and discriminate more, like the poetry and so on. I, that's my first piece in concrete, the stairwell. It's all done by me then, um, 10 mil steel sheet. I enjoyed that as I was saying. So it comes down to very small uh, basalt rocks which I then cut with a grinder. You see me standing there with a grinder. I've never done this before. The first idea for the roof was, the, say, a very obvious one, you have a roof Yes, which has a funny loft, and you can control that by very simple means, in timber and so on and so forth. The roof morphs from the triangular to the parable. Then the inside would have 
plaster board and a very large drawing of vessels which we are dealing with as a painting. And on the outside you would probably have a rhythm or pattern of uh, slate shingles. Um, but we wanted, we, we were not satisfied with it. It would certainly fulfill a coherence in that road with building materials and so on, but we were yeah, nosy and eager to come up with something more extravagant, yeah. And that is a sketch by Martin, with whom we did the bridge, Martin Hoister, um, and myself to deal with a roof which is very, very, which has a very big grain, corn, grain, which has a very big grain which is comparative to um, attic windows. So this roof would contain um, hexagonal pyramids which in a checkerboard fashion go either outwards or inwards and that would be the roof. That is early drawings by Martin. This is the corner of the building up there and it rotates the plan to a structure and then this is how the section would work so it would come Greek stuff it comes together a hundred meter above the building and so on and so forth. This was done <laughs> This was all done in vector works by Martin, which is applaudable, and then we took it uh, to Innsbruck to people like Max, who sits there, and other people who turned that into something more 3D, grasshopper and the lot, and started to calculate how that would work. And we were very much in love with the pattern which we had achieved with this kind of roof, because what we enjoyed with it was there is a, there is a subtle or maybe a true upfront relation between the hexagonal bizarre color and those hexagons. And I'm a little afraid for that. <coughs> but as a figure and this large grain which compares, as I was saying, to dormer windows in the neighborhood, we were happy. And this was either achievable in, uh, in steel sheet or in aluminum. <coughs> We found out, and we had another um, idea about that structure. We wanted to, everywhere where this bends, we wanted to have a slit such that the light would penetrate. Okay, so we would see the whole construct lit by daylight. That's a paradox because there all the forces go, and we learned it the hard way uh, with the me stress, um, as you can see. Um, we would have to invest 11 mil. And that comes up to 10 tons, that equals a bridge which we built in Austria, which spans 50 meters and takes trucks in the lot. And we didn't like that, because I'm old school, okay, in garbage say. And it was terrible. We, were, we, had, we have permission, we probably have the means, not quite, because, I mean, you know this much better than I do, that this is heaps of work. This needs um, um, a global structural survey. Every time you do a change, again. I'm lucky, um, my structural engineer, which I consult in Austria, who works um, for Coop and other people, does it for free and um, okay. We were trying to alter this somehow by introducing almost um, frames into that structure and came up with um, ideas how to laser cut the connections and so on and so forth. In the end we pushed it down to five tons and we think this is even too much. It's 12 meters long, it's seven meters high and it has two planes. So we were, we did build for example industrial, we built with 50, no 48 kilograms of steel per square meter. Here you're talking 10 times as much. This is irritating, very irritating. So we scheitern, what is that in English? Fail. Pardon? Fail. We failed. We, 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 yes, we can build it, but I don't like to see 10 mil or 11 mil of cord hand steel up there or the equivalent in aluminum. Um, this was on my talk in the other days where I showed the idea that everywhere this was bent or welded, it should be disconnected. And we built uh, one to two models, blah, blah, blah. And then Gabi said, this is terribly ugly. And I said, I agree. <laughs> 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 
So the connectors between the, the steel sheet, this is a one to two model. I'm not very fond of it. Uh, I just like to report this to you and show you something very astonishing and I will finish with that in two minutes. This is um, what we are aiming at at the moment. Keep that loft between the triangle and the parable. Uh, who, knowing now, since we spoke to geometrists, that we have a singular condition at the top, at the front, which doesn't make our life much easier. But what we would like to achieve is what Max was drawing, is to have a loft which is then turned into planar hexagons which are forming a mesh. And this mesh would be then, and these are from a program from the named uh, from a guy who designed, uh, designed that program in 2005, I think, and it's also not by us. We would return to a condition where the structure is a honeycomb and that we have a surface on the outside and a surface on the inside. And to somehow explain, that's the last slide to you, what we would like to achieve and mine this. Yes, this is 10 kilometers from your place, this thing up there. So I don't even know, no need to call to attention Parmante or other heroes from the 15th century who knew their way around or the Romini about very different geometries. Very different geometries. This is a, a double layer geometry in a small place. She comes from Marburg, this is somewhere in the deep provinces. They have done that in the 16th century. So to myself, I like to stay very humble about geometry and what we by now can do with it, including those machines. But I would like to play with such things. And um, it will be a structure which is inside on the outside. You have the planar hexagons, and in the planar hexagons, we would like to lay slate, maybe in that fashion, but also different shingles which we can cut from metal, such that you have also on the outside, which is a continuation of planar hexagons, which interrelate. You also play with the water, which spills from that and so on and so forth. I'm not unhappy about the slate because it makes a connection to that. So what you have or read as a pattern in the roof, you can follow that down the columns almost into the road and into the pavement of the road. I think that is not bad. On the inside, we would also have hexagons, but they would be plasterboard. And we would start then to use those hexagons as means of frames almost, in which we paint our stuff, which is related to our attempts to deal with the idea of vessel. And the idea of relief, which is then maybe, yeah. So that is the roof at which, we, at which we are at the moment. So we need support from, and we get it in Innsbruck, in the Kogel. Um, he was there a short while ago, Gabi explained that to me, and I trust that the guys will help us. So that's what I've been, I'm, ref I'm really referring, bluntly, I don't care, I think that works. I refer to that, and I talk about the roof. I mean it. And I would like to read the poem to you because it is probably the artistic piece I'm most proud of. Thomas Kling was so clever and so intelligent and so well read that I found it really hard. Really hard. It's called The House is the Mouth Cave. The house is the text of its inhabitants. Is it fair to speak of the breath, of the deep breath of the people living in the house? Is it fair to speak of the breath of generations that have lived in the house, bad breath in the stuffy house, or doors in the stairwell and from the windows in the neighborhood? Breath from the woman who just gave birth, fast birth, fast breath, rattling of someone dying. The windows are open, the front door opens, the person leaves the house, hesitates, turns around, goes back into the house, returns with an object forgotten, the first time it is 10.35. Is it fair to speak of the breath of the inhabitants and their forgetfulness? Of the speed with which a deserted house becomes a deserted house? Is it fair to say that the stones inside the house come unexpectedly? Is it fair 
to say that the big stones have ended up in the middle of the living room where they don't belong. What some will the neighbors say? Some have you thought about what the neighbors will say? The neighbors breathe in the house, his mother, they leave the house, turn back because they have forgotten something about some. What will your neighbors say when they discover that the garden is in the house? Mother, my garden's breathe is in the house, breathe is like my neighbors do. Everybody has plants in the house, mother. I turn around, I turn the house around because I've forgotten something. I have turned the house upside down. Is it fair, son, to talk about the house breathing so hard that the second floor can drive on the street? Mother, all my neighbors will want to ride when they see what my house can do. The house yawns, it breathes, mother. The house tastes its inhabitants, it opens its mouth cave. The house breathes, it is the text of its inhabitants. The house is at home with itself, it shows itself, it shows the sum of its breath. The house is the mouth cave. Dankeschön, dass ihr zugehört habt. Thank you very much. Dankeschön. A few questions, I'm sure, but I also uh, must rush to uh, something I forgot to announce that after the lecture, the Stiftung, with um, very generous help from a few students, are um, serving drinks and some snacks right out here in Mensa. So that's after the lecture. Before we go that far, a um, few questions I have. Please. Well, I can start to kick stuff on. And what is your take or what is your relationship to place or to site? I mean, you speak quite specifically about um, the work in Australia yeah. in relationship to um, indigenous uh, culture as compared to the more recent Australian culture. And then, of course, the, um, the living room itself. Yeah. Do you have a, a general sort of outlook on, on the value of, of site? Or yeah, I, th I, th I think site delivers in relation to what you are building, not even in the question where you have your entry, but it delivers in terms of geology, in terms of climate, in terms of social circumstance. So I'm obviously referring to genius loci, so I'm, a, I'm in that, yeah, I'm in that um, school. And um, regardless, I find if you, what I was asked uh, to react to is postmodernism with the poetry. In, in, um, by a fellow which was obviously also related to very young stu studies. And I think that an urban uh, scape is well off if, it's, if it can narrate. So I would find, I, I'm, we are trying to find means and ways to deal with the geology, which is in that case the basalt, for example, um, with the cow, with the business of there was, yes, the slaughterhouse and so on and so forth, we talk about that. And in, in that sense, try to give continuation to that place, and this is from where the ideas stem from. So I really relate to that, and Gavi the same. So it's in that school. What about larger scale projects then? So you, you showed, you had a few slides that showed yeah. earlier architectural work yeah. that you did, that you have done. Does that also come into play in those projects? Yeah, if I take the bridge for example, which seems to be a very obvious thing, um, we had um, a bridge was which had a compression member at the top and tension members at the at the floor, and on the ten and then it cantilevered outwards on the two ends, and there were two ribbons, steel ribbons hung. So in that place of that bridge, you would walk as a pedestrian you walk over these steel ribbons, which were only 10 millimeters thick and span 40 meters and were three meters wide. If a truck would go over the top, that would happen. And at the middle, you would walk through the structure. So we used the structure to take people to the river, if you like, and to take the trucks over him. So there it was more on a technical basis. And with industrial, it's a little more light-footed. I will not necessarily refer to that. Um, but um, in most cases, it's somehow to do with the location. We did a one-family home with the two towers, which you probably recall. And between the two towers, which you haven't seen, there is a courtyard, right? 
which which makes reference to the local indigenous plants and so on and so forth. So we are, this is our resource. When we design, we um, we don't feel independent. It's very welcome to work with the local uh, condition, the genius loci. Did it answer? It did. And what about the relationship between? Um, so obviously you know Tobias Rehberg, and I was just referring to this in the conversation we had earlier today. When he did a house, he insisted on this, on seeing this as a piece of art. Mm -hmm. He's an artist. He thinks like an artist. Mm -hmm. He produces art. Mm -hmm. Also when. It is a house. Mm -hmm. In your work, and uh, when I also looked at, I think it also says on your uh, web page, I think it says art, architecture. Do you do art or do you do <coughs> sculpture object as an architect? or? Not every picture is an art piece. Not every house is an art piece, but I would account architecture. I would find architecture in its materiality, in its structure, in its geometry sufficiently independent from program and function. Which is not to say that necessarily to follow um, Patrick, um, to say um, function, so to turn the modern idea around, but what I'm convinced of is that we are there is enough autonomy not necessarily in every building not everywhere I was saying that not in this building which has you and me for one and a half hours in this room and then it's bad breath and so on and so forth but if you do something which is in a sense to society representational or to even a single client representational I think you can and that is the lecture for us with Gelnhausen which is at the same time the lid on our bottle because since then we have trouble to get clients um, Almost any instant in a house, if it's a handrail or God knows what detail, you can design it if you have the time and want that. It's ridiculous in our times because it is very, very slow. It cannot compete with any medium, any media, no chance. So it is almost um, impossible to invest a lot of thought into the convenience of a house in relation that it can talk a little bit and be programmed fine. But it's possible. To Gabi and me it was a good lesson to do this first living room and I think with the new building so like me in the road I was sitting there for three months because I didn't do it so uh, as a pro and it took me a long time but I enjoyed that greatly and it makes you, it made me very humble. <laughs> very humble. Yeah. But I can see at the same time I'm coming, uh, I see at the same time that my position within the community, like you for example, or my alienation to the Städelschule, is also a product that I'm working in the provinces and sit there and do my coupling away and so on and so forth. But um, I'm still alert, I read, I know what is going on and so forth, but I, it is a different type of relation now. That was a question. Yeah, I'm wondering because you started by talking about beauty and how beauty yeah. is really important for you and then you end up with a project that is not far from here and it's about bringing in nature, bringing in the rocks, mm. some uh, paying attention to what's around it. So I wonder like, how is your understanding of nature and beauty? Or is that related or do you mean yeah, it's related. There are two strands. One is that I um, raise the issue of man's ability to create and that leads into, a, into culture and comp competition within cultures. And the other thing is that you, to me, if, if I'm stating that uh, an interior is a phenomena which mainly architects deal with, if you, if you think of the ultimate interior which is the self, um, and the memory of the womb, which doesn't exist in us, but is the, the best contained as an as a interior which you probably can label for mankind and also for animal. Um, and we know about the neurosis, which is to do with the expel from that womb and so on. 
But we know a lot, I, I would argue, we know a lot about interiors and the absolute interior to me is everybody's self. Like yourself, myself, himself and so on. And I would argue that um, men, and then men is females and males, will have criteria in the observation of their own self. And I wonder if you call yourself ugly. I wonder if you find yourself unsociable or if you find uh, disrupting any political means. So I think the self, which is an interior, not for the architects only, this is very deeply rooted in philosophy and other means, and is a classic in the arts, interior and exterior and so on. So if you, if you relate to yourself and see that as a criteria for beauty, I think that's good enough. That's the demand. And if you do an urban, if you do urban, I may be very conservative in this, but if you do urban, I think you are, and you are a pro, I think you are, they can legally ask you if you do it at least ordinarily to say this funny German word, right? <laughs> Rightfully, such that it is livable. Not necessarily comfortable, but it's livable. And I think it's a very, um, straightforward demand. So yes, I relate it to your person as the designer, or me as the designer, or him or her. And I think we are in a competition amongst ourselves. I'm not talking building industry, which is all existing in their own right. I don't mind this. But if you are here, for example, and being so engaged and come from various places across the world, and we um, I'm not necessarily, I, I would be surprised if you put this to doubt. I mean, you make an effort, and, and so on. And I'm trying to make an effort, and I'm not saying I'm producing art, because others have to decide for me. But I would, I would call architecture an art. I would be surprised if somebody says, this is not the case. Why are all these people traveling to famous places which are denying their old program? <laughs> Why? It's architecture, sometimes. It's cities, Antwerpen. Uh, you can, you can call to attention very ordinary places and you know that these places are wow because they have a wonderful urban scape, uh, scope and, and all of this. So yes, I'm positive about, Achim would absolutely disagree, maybe you say something about it, um, about to beauty in relation, uh, work in relation to beauty, what he has produced in our place. I'll give you an example. Achim, this guy sitting there, uh, who works with noise. I was asking him, I was then living in Frankfurt, I would like to have an art piece by him, with noise. Was it noise? No, it was light. <laughs> and he said two weeks later, yes, I have found a place for you on your way between work and home. I said, you must be nuts. I would like to have it in my place, okay? <laughs> and then he came with a very nice piece, which is very narrative. He had, in a space which is maybe in scale, this is two to one to my scale, right? balcony. He had Flashlights on the floor, on flashlights, how do we call them? Beamers. Beamers on the floor on this side, eight pieces and eight bulbs there. And they were driven by a random order which he designed in a software and they would go up and down. Not up and down, they would go on and off. That's the right word, okay? Right. It wasn't random. It was directed by uh, radioactivity, really. Okay. So the amount of radioactive deterioration would uh, cost the batteries. Okay. So if you were in full light, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> they still work. What it made was at night, it was, um, it was remarkably pretty in rain because the surface was galvanized steel on which they had their rays. The rays were only so wide, but exactly to the middle, which would be here in that case. So this, would, this one would rate exactly here and the other one to there. And then it was a very quiet and sometimes more exciting play of light on that. So that was it. end of that story. Would you add something? And I found that quite romantic, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's trouble. Should I say something about beauty? No. Okay. I'll leave it up to you. Yeah. Any more? Vielen Dank. Dankeschön. Dankeschön. Thanks.